welcome very much, Alice Meadows, to today's episode. Um, it's a great pleasure having you. Thanks for joining. Thank you for the invitation. So, Alice is the Director of Community Engagement for NISO, the National Information Standards Organization. And there, at NISO, she's responsible for engaging with and developing the NISO community, including communicating the value of, of the project, the events, and programs. Very curious to hear more about that as, um, as we dive into the discussion. And Great. you're also, um, should I say, co-founder of More Brains, which is a consultancy firm. Um, yep. to access to perspectives um, and very much in service of the scholarly stakeholders. Um, yep. So yeah, um, so please, maybe diving into the discussion, could you share with mm -hmm. us what brought you to where you are today at these two institutions? And then later on, we'll also touch on the famous um, scholarly kitchen where many interesting things are boiling and um yeah and then and then of course the work that you did with orchid but it's probably where yeah early earlier and okay maybe i should stop <laughs> so let's hear from you thanks for joining sure thank you so yes um well most of my career has actually been spent in scholarly publishing so i started out in pre-internet days well pre-internet days um at what was then called basil blackwell publishing in Oxford, England, uh, uh, as you can tell from my accent, that's where I um, originally came from. I now live in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so I worked, I had, I, for, I don't know, a long time worked in scholarly publishing, mostly in journals, uh, mostly in marketing uh, and communications. Um, I uh, had a spell of consulting when I had my, when my children were small, and then went back to work for Blackwell, which was then Blackwell Publishing, which was subsequently acquired by Wiley um, in 2007, I think. So then I had some experience of working for a big commercial publisher as opposed to a smaller private publisher. So it's all very good experience, and I honestly loved scholarly publishing, but um, also knew that working for a big commercial organisation of any sort really wasn't for me. So I started looking around for other opportunities and was lucky enough to be hired to work at Orchid just at the time when they had received a, a very nice $3 million grant from the Helmsley um, Foundation, which uh, basically enabled the, the organization to double in size. So there was a bunch of us that all came on new at the same time. And it was relatively early in Orchid's um, evolution anyway. This was 2015. So it was a very exciting time to join. And I discovered that much so I loved scholarly publishing. My real passion was for research infrastructure and in particular open research infrastructure. Um, and, and also for community engagement rather than sort of, you know, more traditional marketing and communications, which I'd been moving out of anyway in the publishing world, but really got more immersed in at Orchid. So I was at Orchid for about four and a half years and then joined NISO uh, more or less exactly three years ago, actually, um, to do community engagement there. And they hadn't really had anybody doing that um, before. Um, so it's been really rewarding and wonderful to mm -hmm. kind of make my mark there and, you know, figure out how to, my, my goal when I started at NISO was uh, a somewhat facetious goal was to make standards sexy because people think that, you know, they're very dry and technical and boring, which, you know, at some levels they kind of are, they're very, very important, but what's, what standards enable us to do and what the research infrastructure, infrastructure enables us to do is incredibly critical to how we do research and how how that research is then disseminated around the world. And mm -hmm. so that's the bit I think, you know, publishing is a part of that, but the infrastructure kind of really underpins whether mm -hmm. it's publishing, funding, research itself, the, the whole thing is underpinned by this research infrastructure. So I think that's why I've been just drawn to it and feel so passionately about it. Mm -hmm. So we dig in exactly there. So as you know, we've also had conversations before this one um and you also kind of invited us to a nice little conference was it two years ago um where we presented africa archive so from your like how the scholarly infrastructure has been before orchid came to life and now with it and other standards being established or like yeah, being established like being there to 
to be used. Increasingly so. I know that adoption is going so and so. It could be quicker to make the system functional and efficient to its potential. Um, and with every archive, we are looking at the whole infrastructure and dissemination discoverability opportunities from a sort of a global south perspective and how that can leverage. I know that um, values like equity, transparency, research um, integrity are also the core of your work and, um, and of your personal and preferences and understanding, but yeah, of personal importance and professional importance as well. So yeah, could you take us maybe through a few, like the the journey from before ORCID and now and other standards and what NICE was mm -hmm. doing in that regard and facilitating conversations that's that's you know like also enormous as being a facilitator and and uh yeah just getting the word out but also trend setting. So well, where we are today and how we can maybe leverage adoption. So, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. This adoption, not just of ORCID, but of um, the research infrastructure in general, is that that's probably the single biggest challenge. In many ways, the technology is there, but the um, ability and sometimes the desire to take advantage of it are not necessarily there. And also, uh, you know, parts of the research infrastructure are open, parts of it are not so open or even closed, proprietary. Um, so not everybody has equal access from that perspective. Um, most of it, if not all of it, has been developed with very much the global north and the scientific community in mind rather than being more inclusive. And so now what happens is, you know, there are, there are very well-meaning and sometimes, you know, fairly successful efforts to retrofit to meet the needs of those communities. But mm -hmm. then again, you have the challenge of people who've been excluded from the decision making process, understandably, not feeling very bought into then using something that was developed for other communities. So I think, you know, the, the big challenge, one of the big challenges for um, really kind of harnessing the power of research infrastructure, whether that's ORCID, standards, other forms of persistent identifiers, um, anything really is social as much as if not more than technical. Um, and, and that makes it more difficult because, you know, technical solutions are, if not easy, then kind of less complicated to mm -hmm. find. But but persuading people that they should then use those solutions is, in my experience anyway, much more challenging. And, and that's why, you know, I <laughs> kind of selfishly feel that, that my sort of work, my, you know, community engagement, not just mine, but, you know, people like me who engage in trying to bring the community along with us is critical and often overlooked part of that less so now but I think you know th there's many organizations miss a trick by not making community engagement a strategic part of what they do mm. so who is the community for NISO oh for NISO it's um, basically anybody in the information theoretically anybody in the information community globally um, so that could be, you know, publishers and content providers, librarians and other, you know, curators of content, uh, the vendors, service providers that, you know, provide the platforms and, and products that help deliver and, and create those that content, the infrastructure providers. Um, so kind of any, anybody that is creating curating disseminating information um is really part of our community in theory now in practice um NISO is a us-based organization and has much stronger community in the us uh, than anywhere else in the world we do have members from outside of the us but not very many we we do get people from outside of the us engaged in our work but again not that many i think what we've been quite successful at in terms of um, bringing people into the conversation is a, is a diversity of types of organizations so how NISO works is by developing consensus sort of bringing people from different types of organizations and different communities together to solve problems shared problems through a consensus process so mm. I think we're quite good at for example bringing different types of libraries together with different types of publishers together with the vendors that support them to find solutions 
mostly, not exclusively, but mostly within the US. What we have been less good at so far and what we're really trying to work on is bringing people from those other typically underrepresented communities into our work. And as part of that, and I'm going to do a little plug here because uh, the applications are going to open shortly. We, um, three years ago, when I first started, we introduced a scholarship programme, the NISO Plus scholarship programme, mm -hmm. which is intended for people who feel their voice is currently or their organisation's voice is currently underrepresented in, in the NISO community. And it gives them an opportunity to get involved with our work um, we, we offer them a free place at the conference they get free access to all our educational content webinars mm -hmm. for three years and they get offered lots of opportunities to join working groups committees write for our blog that sort of thing and it's really been one of the joys of my time at NISO to see that program develop and to build really good relationships with some of these people who we want and hope will be the next generation of leaders in the information world and we hope will stay connected with NISO in that sort of context mm -hmm. and a good well over half of them are really actively engaged with what we do which is fantastic so we now have you know 20 plus new voices who bring different perspectives to our work and they really are very global this last year for 2022 more than half the participants in the program are from outside uh, the US so that's the direction I think one of the directions mm -hmm. one of the ways that we can help grow our community outside of the US yeah okay. that's that's excellent like also I appreciate I saw that you made extra effort to make it inclusive or globally inclusive as an event the NASA conference um, by not only the fellowship but also having like a like a dedicated and very easy to buy in should I call it a Viva program or a Viva program? There's, there's, so, so yes, we have them. But the, um, there's, but the there's ones are like not so typical, like you would see in other places, like publishers do it. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we have, we, we do really do make every effort to make the conference mm -hmm. as inclusive as and accessible as possible. So it's virtual, mm -hmm. um, fully virtual. Um, it's held in two blocks of time so that it's mm -hmm. office hours for the Americas and Europe, Middle East and Africa for one chunk and then Asia Pacific for the other with um, evening, sort of early evening for the for the West Coast, but um, later evening for the East Coast um, for the other chunk of time. So that and then we also we're lucky we have some great sponsors, which means that we are able to keep the cost down. So we have a very low flat rate for anyone in lower income countries, students, unemployed, retirees. And we also have a, a sort of needs based fund where people very kindly donate um, to cover the cost of people who can't afford um, to even to pay the very reduced rate. So mm. uh, we, we do, and we really try to, you know, make the speakers as, um, you know, diverse as possible. You've been very mm. kind with putting us in contact with people, um, including Joy, who has been fantastic and is actually on our planning committee. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been very, there's a long, long way to go. It's very far from perfect, but it is nice to feel that we're making some steps in the right direction. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you um, basically mentioned the many efforts you're um, taking on to the organizing committee because it takes more than just making announcements and putting up a Viva program to so really yeah. inclusive. Like inclusion needs to be proactive mm -hmm. from the. Yes in inviting organization because you, you mentioned earlier like something that's designed for another community is not an easy buy-in for our, any other community no. um and yeah so so it's really like it was really refreshing and and uplifting to see how how you found so many ways in engaging any participant and stakeholder of the conference and providing various options and ways to also counter no, it's a cross finance, like, yeah. yeah. So, because I, with access to perspectives, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I have similar challenges, and I know how, like, even if there's opportunities out there, I still need to find a way to to the target audience, um, to be accessible <laughs> and yes. inviting, also being yeah. seen as inviting, and not just you know another offer which may or may not be useful. But okay. it's also, I think, um, you know, 
we all have to learn to take a step backwards in order for other people to be able to take a step forwards. And sometimes that's hard. You get invited to do something and it's flattering and you want to say yes, but actually it's, I find it incredibly um, rewarding to say, naturally, you don't need to hear from me again. (laughs) You know, what about this person who you haven't heard from? And I think often there's this, perception that people only want to hear from those at the top and those at the top are you know mostly white mostly men mostly well educated mostly from the global north and yes they have something to say but um but that doesn't mean that other people don't also have something to say that's just as interesting and sometimes more interesting but they don't have the opportunity to do so Mm. so I think anything any of us can do when we're we're offered the chance to contribute to say well thank you very much. But have you considered, you know, this person who I know has a really interesting perspective that hasn't been widely heard? Um, I think, you know, that's one of the ways that we can all at a very individual basis, help Mm. move things forward. And and you again are very good at this, Jo. Yeah, yeah, that's also what I'm practicing. And as you said, sometimes it's a little bit painful, because I also need and, 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 you know, I'm flattered by the opportunities. But then to look around of who else is there or who else might be better fitted for this opportunity than me. And then it might still benefit all of us in the team or in, in the community or, you know, in the colleagueship. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and, and as you said, it's so rewarding to see somebody else flourish because you or I enabled that to happen. Yeah. And there's nothing, yeah, there's no loss really. So there's there's more gain instead. Yeah, it's just making the pool bigger, I think. Yeah, and there's bigger and bigger and more diverse. Also, (laughs) um, I like just an anecdote. There were, it's also so typical. I get two two females in this conversation. And I was at an event lately um, where the organizers mentioned, oh, Sorry, we really tried, but we have a male only panel and we really tried to get a woman on this panel and we didn't like there was, there was just no one available. Uh, and I was like, okay, so if, if that's what you have to say, then maybe you didn't try hard enough for once. But then it got worse when one of the panelists who's male apologized for not being female when he started talking. I was like, oh my God, like, it was really good. And then I just, chat in the chat like this is like inequity for genders um like any gender based or ethnic inequity is not a joke like it's not funny (laughs) i'm just leaving this year like hello um a few few years ago um lauren kane who's now the executive director of bio one and i did some work on um gender disparity at conferences um we we happened to be sitting next to each other at a i can't remember which conference it was now but um, one of the scully publishing conferences and it was it was an all-male panel which we were sort of harumphing at each other about and we looked around at the audience and the audience was not overwhelmingly but you know definitely at least half and half if not more than half women to men and so then we went through the program and we counted up how many men male speakers versus females there were and of course it was disproportionately at that stage weighted towards men so then we we sort of um, put our heads together and decided we'd do like a little mini not very scientific but a little analysis of recent academic publishing conferences to see you know but was this true across the board and with the notable a couple of notable exceptions I think SSP was pretty even and I think OASPA was the other one that's off the top of my head that was pretty you know much much more balanced but the rest were all in some cases horrendously disproportionately you know male versus female speakers but the good thing about that analysis so I think we published it in the Scully Kitchen in fact um and um we then redid it a, a year or so later, and we found that all, with the exception of one society, I think all the all the societies had made a real effort. I, I mean, I don't want to take all the credit for it, but I, but it did get you know there was there was quite a lot of sort of oh my god this is not very good, and I think it did make a difference. So sometimes mm. it's that whole thing of just articulating the problem 
and sure. providing a, you know some evidence it's, that's often that's all it takes for people to I don't think people are intentionally trying to kind of replicate the old world or world order for the most part some probably are but you know mostly I think people just do things because that's the way they've always been done and all yeah. you really need to do is kind of challenge it a bit and give them an alternative and give them some sort of evidence of why things could be different and how to do things differently and most people most of the time I think will rise to that challenge yeah and yeah thanks for sharing that and I think why I mentioned this here is also because what we just talked about earlier like if I I believe they tried and I believe it might have been challenging but then to stop there and not like those men they could get for the panel why not ask them, is there a female colleague anywhere yes. here, a junior, you can mentor into being ready and and kind of yeah, ready, also mentally ready and happy to take on this challenge of being a panelist here. And it's, it was just yeah. a five minute input, it was not a big deal. And that doesn't seem to be an easy thing for many to to consider. Yeah. Like, does it always just, have to be the CEO or the kind of management level to represent an organization or instead? Yeah, so. It's it's often, in my experience, it's actually without wanting to sort of diss the, the senior leaders who obviously do have a lot of interesting things to say. But, you know, very often it's the sort of middle tier who have enough strategic knowledge and understanding to get the big picture, but are also kind of immersed enough in the the real work of the organization to understand the challenges and opportunities there and they often in my view anyway have really yeah. interesting stuff to say particularly I mean at NISO for example where what we're trying to do is to come up with you know the conference is is intended as, as I think you noted you know it's, it's not meant to be a talking at you kind of event it's a talking together to figure out what our common challenges are and really importantly to come up with some concrete ideas for how we can address those challenges so out of each conference we try to get two or three solid ideas that we can actually use to affect change which again is really important because an, an awful lot of talking happens about all this stuff mm -hmm. but it often doesn't translate into action mm -hmm. um so I, I i really love that what we try to do is to you know come up with those real actions and I also think it's very important as I was saying earlier that you know we take some individual responsibility for actions so that it's not we're not just relying on you know organizations like NISO or companies or other people but we take some accountability and responsibility ourselves for taking action and effecting change so okay can you could you elaborate on that because you can either make an institutional statement, NISO stands for equity, and this is how we do it, and then all the staff sign up for that, and there's a kind of community or institutional agreement and strategic plan how to implement, or, but how can you do that on a personal level, working for a particular organization, or doing that wherever you go as an individual? So I would say two things. First, I would say a top down, OK, now we're going to be an equitable organisation is not going to work because, you know, that's not that's not an inclusive way to make that decision, is it? So I really believe that if you are going to um, and I think you should, I think all organisations should, um, you know, make their best efforts to be, you know, diverse and equitable and inclusive. But if it's a top down decree, it's not going to work it's probably not going to work if it's a grassroots thing that the leadership isn't bought into either. So you've got to have a coming together of the stakeholders within the organisation mm -hmm. to agree that this is what is wanted and needed and what that's going to look like to have mm -hmm. any chance of success is, is my view. And from that, you can build towards, you know, taking some individual accountability. And so, you know, I will give an example without naming any names at all, mm -hmm. but um, uh you know, if you see somebody engaging in behaviour that's not, you know, offensive, bad behaviour, but for example, somebody um, being asked to to, to represent your organisation who, um, when there's other people who maybe have less opportunity. So it's, it's the thing, actually using the conference example is a good example. So I am asked to speak at a conference. It's a topic I'd love to speak on. I'm, I would love to say yes. And I'm very tempted to do so. But as an individual, I can I can also think, well, you know, I've spoken at this conference before. People have heard what I have to say. 
but my colleague over here hasn't got had as much experience I can suggest her as an alternative to me I can work with her I can mentor her I can you know as needed coach her and then she will be well equipped to do what I've been invited to do but she will bring a different dimension it will be a new opportunity for her and it's a way to demonstrate in action that we are living what we say we want to be which is to be more diverse and equitable and inclusive Mm. does that make sense totally and I would like to go back to the question like because you said the top-down approach would never work how like in my view like as a CEO of my one woman show access to perspectives, which also collaborates with other co-creatives. So it's a little bit, it's not like a cooperative, like more brands is, and we can come to talk about maybe, maybe it is, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, not formally. But I define for myself, like I define values for the institution based on my personal values. And knowing very well that any human being on this planet will have it easy to buy into those this value system because it's you know all the common commonly discussed values such as transparency colleagueship or collaboration versus versus like over competition so competition i mean i can sometimes sense it with colleagues because we compete we, we all need to make money <laughs> to survive as a business um, and we also need to eat as individuals. <laughs> so it's very pragmatic and very livelihood driven. But um, but I believe and I've experienced that collaboration is stronger than a competitive um, yeah. approach and also more rewarding. So that then transparency, um, research rigor for the scholarly aspects, um, yeah, you name it. So when, when an institution or the management at an institution defines that as, as so basically, so do you think looking back at in the 90s and early 2000s and maybe second decade as well, um, like there was a big splash of CSR, corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that has brought from I don't have, like, I didn't follow this thoroughly, but I know that it's been misused. It's been, it's been some, what, what you might refer to as whitewashing going on or greenwashing when it comes to yeah. ecological, no, what's corporate yeah. logical responsibility. Yeah. So do you think this value setting for organizations has a similar dilemma or can it actually be easy for the staff then to feel good in an institution that not only says this is the values that we want to operate based on these. Um, and then the staff can hold the management accountable. I think in theory that's right. <laughs> but I, I oh. do think, you know, if you if you have a leadership that isn't really brought in and all they're doing is checking boxes, as you say, whitewashing, greenwashing, whatever, then they'll saying that you want to be more diverse and equitable and inclusive is easy, right? We all, yes, in theory, want to say that, yeah. but making it happen in practice takes work and it takes work at the organizational level and the individual level. So if an organization checks the boxes that says, yes, I want to do this, but then for example, they don't, I don't know, give, have good parental leave or they don't, um, you know, support people who have caring responsibilities or they don't actively encourage their staff to, you know, engage in volunteer opportunities. I'm not saying they should necessarily do all those things, but, you know, those are examples of how an organisation can live those values of being diverse, equitable and inclusive. Mm. But I think many organisations who claim to be want to be diverse sexual and inclusive don't necessarily do those things they think you know it's it, it it's harder to live the, live your values than to define your values i think often and, and that's true yeah. of people as well as organizations yeah i mean there you say something which i also painfully sometimes experience like where i find it hard not to be taken down by my, my own ego and ending up in the competitiveness trap thought like in my thoughts where I want like my 
my better self wants to be more cooperative, but then we all make experiences of being hurt. So that for any management level decision maker. Um, but wouldn't it also attract um, an audience, clients, users, and staff members that are that value these values and therefore would hold the management accountable instead of not having them officially on the website openly like you know but again i think this is why it needs to be a, a bi-directional thing it needs yeah. to be a genuinely bought in leadership and a genuinely engaged staff team whatever I, I'm, if i may i perhaps can give you an example um from ssp so when i was ssp president last year you know ssp is definitely i think anybody who has been in, you know involved in it would say it's a very values driven organization but we had never defined what those values were mm -hmm. so when we were thinking about our strategic planning I wanted to you know relate that back to our core values which we hadn't articulated so we one of the things that we did was we, we set up um, a task force a small task force that was led by the now president Miranda Walker and the now president elect Randy Townsend um, to to work on our core values to define them and we were pretty strict we said we don't want more than about four um, and we want them to be we want to develop them in a, through a consensus process um, and it was an astonishingly quick and productive and heartwarming experience because it was both a sort of you know it was the board you know we said we wanted to do this and the task force was run by two board members um, but we also very much involved all the committee co-chairs and people like that, so the people who are actively engaged in our community. And it was an incredibly easy process. We had a we did a we we had a sort of Zoom call with about, I don't know, I think 40 people on, and we sort of whittled our way down through. We had a, a big pack of, you know, here's 40 values, you know, yes, yes, no, maybe. And we whittled it down and down and down, and we got down to uh, I can't remember the back. 10 or 12 or something like that and then we did a survey we did a google form and whittled it down further and then we did a little bit of wordsmithing to define the four values that we came up with and as a result i think everybody is, is really good to have those values articulated because i think we all kind of implicitly knew them but it, everybody also feels really good about the process because it was a it was a good inclusive consensual process so i, th I think you know it is possible to be top down and bottom up in a very productive and inclusive and um, enjoyable, actually, way. And then I think it will be th some th things stick if you do it like that, because everybody feels ownership, everybody feels accountable. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. It's really, um, I find this quite fascinating, enlightening, and also motivating. To so. Does it come down to, so the question is, is the lack of that due to what's now also becoming known and often referred to as toxic working environments or, and why is that? Like when it's only capital money driven, revenue driven. And in my belief, like not to divert too much away from our today's topic, and we will come back to the scholarship <laughs> and the research infrastructure, but because there is like, like also open science, which we both very much engaged in and passionate mm -hmm. about, um, is values driven and heart centered or whatever heart centered means, but um, values driven for sure. So we as scholars and scholarly stakeholders are relearning really to design our workplace and the work we do and how we do it, how we engage our so with our users and clients and, and target audiences in a values-based approach. And then earlier episode we had here we had a conversation with Rebecca Kennison, Simone Saki. And she and Chris I used to work together at Blackwell many years ago. She's a she's a friend. Yeah, it was so lovely. And they've published the walking the talk white paper on toward the values aligned academy yeah yep. which we featured there 
And I was basically similar to what you just described in a workplace or for an organization that did this across I think 12 US um, universities. Um, and so, yeah, it's basically, and then, but there was very much more about the pain points, how people had personal values and they saw themselves restricted in, in implementing them in their work, like transparency yeah. and whatever, like all the values that you can think of, like transparency, rigor, like research rigor, um, collaboration. Uh, yeah. It's like, you know, there's a whole list. <laughs> Um, so question now is what's holding us back to, and like what I want to add also, I, as a business owner and with also the colleagues and co-creatives that I engage with yourself, with more brains and also at nice or what we just talked about, like how we want to operate in this ecosystem and like. But why is it so new that we have to reinvent things that are natural to us as humans and also as a service provider like any company it doesn't matter to me it doesn't matter what tech status an institution has everyone came here to serve like everyone also institutional versus corporates but then at some point the question is how much is there like i had also had a previous conversation on this show with marcana from picture and i I will also quote him more often because this really struck me. He said, as a CEO of a company, I don't want to build a monopoly because I know that's not healthy. He also speaks probably as a biologist like I am. So we know we need diversity in the system. And that's only when things can run smoothly in the long run. Otherwise, we just create a cancer tumor kind of thing situation. Um, but we see one monopoly rise after the other or yeah so the question is i think i, I don't know what i want to say here. so when what you also said is um so first i don't want to build a monopoly here we want we need to collaborate with service providers and also i always make sure that we as a company give more than we take out like of course there's an extraction of money because the com the service needs to continue to be of value yeah but they provide services that are actually useful for the community they're here to serve. And that's also what I want to achieve. And that's what NASA is here to do. And then there's others who probably also think that's what they do, but uh, the balance is not, it's, you know, has a, an imbalance. Yeah. So how can we make sure to, to keep the balance? Okay, that's well, the question of the millennium. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm not sure where we ended up with the question, but I know we have to wrap up in a minute, so I'm going to end with a, with an answer that may or may not be an answer <laughs> to the question, which is I think that the answer to almost everything, um, possibly in the world, but certainly in the scholarly communications world, is is more transparency, mm. um, and I think you know uh, you know whether that's around issues of diversity and equity and inclusion you know shining a light on what's happening both good and bad helps us make things better you, i mean you you can't improve things if you don't know that they're bad um you can't celebrate things that are good if you don't know they're good you know so that it, that's an element of it but also in terms of sort of the research integrity side of things and building trust uh you know you don't Things don't have to be open. I think, you know, in an ideal world, mm. open is better than closed, but there are clearly examples where that's that couldn't ever be the case, shouldn't ever be the case. And there are examples where it's not at the moment and it probably won't be for some time. But I don't think there's any excuse for not being transparent about the processes yeah. and the people yeah. and um who's involved, why they're, in, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I feel provenance is is really important from that perspective, you know, being able to see, okay, this. This mm. article was, um, you know, published by these people. The information about it was collected by these people. The information has then flowed to these systems. That kind of thing seems to me to be a very important step towards improving trust um, yeah. and the integrity of the research we publish. I think that's what you just said there. Like, I think that's the biggest um, problem with the term open science because 
most researchers are scared of that open aspect. And it's not about opening everything up because there's, there's like you said, there's hundreds of reasons not to be fully open about the research workflow, security-wise, authority-wise, uh, accountability-wise. Um, like there's many reasons. And there's, there's personal data to be protected, um, animal species that are endangered and threatened yeah. of extinction to be protected. So that like the term, so, and then on a previous episode about fair data, I figured maybe you should just call it fair science instead of open science. But now what you just said, maybe transparent science is, is better because as, even if we don't see exactly what's happening, but we need to be able to trace the people are accountable who can yeah, open exactly. if need be. So, yeah. so that's, uh, so, wow. Okay, so that's something that's I would advocate for. <laughs> if, I, if I could wave my wand and wish for one thing, that's probably what it would be in terms of scholarly communications. Yeah, so let's push for transparency more than for openness, because I think that's really what, what's holding the researchers back who are yeah. meant to be using all of these opportunities that we have now with open science infrastructure. Yeah. Wow, okay, that's a high, high note to end this episode with. To be continued, if you wish, if like, like I, I hope we have another opportunity so in the future, maybe in another format. Um, but I think that's been great as a closing point and statement and a call to action. Yeah, thank you. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. It was very, very, very fun and definitely to be continued, even if it's just over a glass of wine sometime or a cup oh, of yeah. coffee. Let's do that <laughs> whenever soon. I'll definitely. Um... Uh, ping you when I'm in Berlin and if you're around it would be lovely. Mm -hmm.